Welcome again to Grand Rounds, um, uh, especially on this snowy Massachusetts day. Um, we are lucky to be joined by one of our own today, Dr. Laura Payne. For those of you who uh, need continuing education credits, uh, you can look in the chat box and you'll see all the information for signing in, but the code for today is 525. So if you text that into the Cloud CME number, um, that will register you uh, for today's session. But it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Payne. She's a clinical psychologist and director of the Clinical and Translational Pain Research Lab at McLean Hospital. She has been awarded numerous NIH grants, including a career development grant to examine pain mechanisms in adolescents and young adults with menstrual pain. Her current research focuses on identifying neurobiological, behavioral, and psychological biomarkers related to pain, particularly menstrual pain in adolescents. Specifically, she's interested in identifying factors that are associated with the transition from recurrent to chronic pain in girls and young women. Her work also extends to developing and evaluating novel treatments for menstrual pain, such as cognitive behavioral therapy and natural supplements. And appropriately, today she's going to be speaking with us about taming the taboo, why walking or why talking about menstrual pain is essential to psychiatric care. It's really my pleasure to turn the uh, grand rounds over to Dr. Payne. Thanks so much, Chris, and thanks um, everybody for uh, joining me, uh, as Chris mentioned, on this very snowy day, um, which is a special treat for me uh, coming from California about a year and a half ago. Uh, so today I'll be presenting about um, why menstrual pain is important and relevant to you and the care that you provide uh, for your patients and some of the things that we can do to really enhance women's uh, mental health care by talking about it. Oops. Let's see here. Um, I don't have any financial disclosures, but the information and some of the data I'll be presenting today have been supported by several grants through NIH, as well as a seed grant from the UCLA uh, Children's Discovery and Innovation Institute. So first things first, uh, I just thought it might be helpful to go over a little bit about the uh, female reproductive anatomy. Um, because even though this may seem uh, like basic information, many girls, women, um, and adults um, are not aware of what the anatomy is. So just in a very basic sense, um, in the ovaries, uh, there are eggs that are released about every month um, they travel through the fallopian tube and into the uterus where the lining of the uterus, which is called the endometrium, has been thickening in, anti in anticipation of implanting a fertilized egg. If the egg is not fertilized, then the lining is shed along with the unfertilized egg through the vagina. And here is um, a depiction of the hormone changes that we typically see during the menstrual cycle. So you can see that during the period, the menstrual period, um, and day one of the menstrual cycle is the first day of menstruation, um, the hormone levels are pretty low. As uh, the cycle progresses past menstruation and prior to ovulation, we see an increase in estrogen and then a, uh, a peak in luteinizing hormone, which is what triggers um, ovulation or the egg to be released from the ovary. If the egg is fertilized, then the progesterone levels stay high, but if it's not fertilized, the progesterone and estrogen levels that increase during the luteal phase start to drop, and then that is what triggers um, the shedding of the lining of the uterus, which is, um, the menstruation. So I have my first uh, polling question here, and I'd like to know um, what, at what phase in the menstrual cycle are psychiatric symptoms generally most severe for women? Let's see if any of you have a guess. 
Okay, we're almost there. That looks about right. Um, okay, so most of you guessed the premenstrual phase. Yes, um, so you would be right about that. Um, the premenstrual phase is definitely part of the phase, uh, one of the phases that we see the most um, psychiatric symptoms or symptom exacerbation for women. But this was kind of a trick question because it's not just the premenstrual phase, it's also the menstrual phase. So this, this um, time prior to menstruation as well as during menstruation is where we typically see um, the changes in psychiatric symptoms. And collectively, this is known as the perimenstrual phase. So close that. Okay. So what do we know about mental health symptoms and the menstrual cycle? Um, there is a huge body of literature on these different types of symptoms and diagnoses. So I'm just gonna touch on each a, a little bit that very generally summarizes what has been found. But with anxiety, we know that in the premenstrual phase, there tends to be increased state anxiety as well as fatigue. Um, whereas in the menstrual phase, we see increased reactivity to physical sensations. For psychosis, there tends to be increased psychiatric admissions in women with schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders um, in this perimenstrual phase, including premenstrual and menstrual. Um, but this is not clearly related to symptom exacerbation. So it hasn't been clearly shown that symptoms change, but the distress about the symptoms does seem to increase. Um, potentially resulting in the, the psychiatric admissions. Cravings are usually highest during the perimenstrual period in substance use disorders and in healthy women. There can be increased hypomanic or manic episodes in the premenstrual phase and bipolar disorder. In borderline personality disorder, we can see um, increased reactive aggression and anger in the mid-luteal phase, which is just about at the, the premenstrual phase. Um, and for eating disorders, we see weight preoccupation, emotional eating, and negative affect highest in the perimenstrual phase. So quite a few areas where we're seeing this symptom exacerbation. And of course, um, with regard to depression, there have also been two um, syndromes that have received their own diagnoses because they are so clearly um, tied to the menstrual phase. Premenstrual syndrome is characterized by irritability or sadness in this premenstrual phase. And it can also be related to exacerbation of depression in women who are already experiencing depression. And then premenstrual dysphoric disorder uh, is, an, is a severe form of PMS with very severe mood symptoms that we see again in the luteal phase, which is, is really the premenstrual phase. So we see quite a few changes happening across all different types of symptoms. And in fact, a recent uh, meta-analysis of 32 papers that included 3,800 participants looked at the overall risk of mental health events, which are defined as anxiety, psychosis, substance use, and suicide risk during the menstrual cycle phases from what has been published. And they found that the greatest risk for these mental health events occurred in the menstrual phase and in the premenstrual phase, which is what we've seen in some of the, the um, earlier work that I presented. But what was really interesting um, is that during the menstrual phase, when they looked at that specifically compared to the other phases of the cycle, there was a 26% greater risk of suicide deaths, a 17% greater risk of suicide attempts, and a 20% greater risk of psychiatric admissions um, compared to the other phases. In the premenstrual phase, there was a 13% greater risk of psychiatric admissions. So clearly these changes in the menstrual cycle are dramatically affecting women and women's health to the point of increasing their risk of death. And so we're wondering, you know, why is this happening? What is, what is causing some of this, the, these symptom changes? 
And I think an obvious and understandable first uh, explanation would be hormones. Um, and certainly the evidence suggests that hormones do play a role, possibly a very significant role, um, but the exact mechanisms or the ex exact hormones um, that cause these changes, we still don't know. There's um, ovarian hormones such as estrogen and progesterone, and in particular, allopregnanolone, which is a metabolite of progesterone that seems to um, affect both mood, anxiety, and other emotions, but it is not exactly clear in which ways. Um, and so there's still a lot of work to be done there. And it could be even the ratio of the hormones within an individual person that changes that could cause the symptoms. So there's a, there's a lot of complicating um, factors there that we still haven't completely figured out. Another possibility is social isolation. Um, certainly if a woman is experiencing a lot of intense discomfort in the premenstrual or menstrual phases, this may limit her ability to connect with other people, um, friends or family members and result in her feeling somewhat isolated during that time. And certainly that isolation could have an impact on emotional um, and psychiatric symptoms as well. And related to this, um, physical symptoms and discomfort can cause activity limitations. Uh, some women understandably use exercise to cope with emotional symptoms um, or, other act or other activities they may engage in and may be limited in these activities uh, during this time because of physical discomfort. So all of these things could contribute um, together to affect different uh, emotions. But there's one other factor that is important to consider too, because that has been tied to uh, depression and anxiety as well, and that is pain. Because we would expect pain to occur uh, maybe a little bit in the premenstrual phase, but certainly in the menstrual phase uh, for many women. And menstrual pain is known as dysmenorrhea. And there are really two kinds of dysmenorrhea. There's primary dysmenorrhea, and this is when there's menstrual pain without an identified pathology. So it's believed to uh, happen due to an increase of what's called uterine prostaglandins. These are chemicals that trigger the contraction of the uterus to shed the lining. Um, and so Earlier research um, has certainly uh, suggested that this is the case, but I will say that it hasn't been entirely consistent of finding differences in levels in uterine prostaglandins between those with menstrual pain and those without. So it's a significant factor, but it's probably not the only reason. And the other cause of menstrual pain um, or the other type of menstrual pain is called secondary dysmenorrhea. And this is when there's menstrual pain caused by um, a pathology uh, or a medical condition. The most common one of these uh, conditions is called endometriosis. And this is where the endometrium, the lining of the uterus actually grows outside of the uterine wall. It can grow on the ovaries and fallopian tubes and even the bowel and be very painful. Another condition is called adenomyosis. And this is when the endometrium grows deep inside the, the uterine wall and can also be painful. Uterine fibroids and pelvic inflammatory disease um, are also causes of secondary dysmenorrhea. And what's important about secondary dysmenorrhea is that, that these conditions can also result in more chronic pelvic pain. So that the woman is experiencing pelvic pain, not just during menstruation, but at other times in the menstrual cycle too. And they can result in other types of pain problems, including dyspareunia, which is pain during sex, um, dysuria, which is pain during urination, and dyskesia, which is pain during bowel movements. Dysmenorrhea is a pretty big problem um, that we don't often talk about. It can affect up to 90% of reproductive age girls and women. Again, depending on how you measure it, um, with some people having more mild pain, other people having more severe pain. 
But even the people with just this severe pain, that's about 25% of reproductive age girls and women, which is still a huge portion of our population. It's the leading cause of school and work absences and the most common gynecological complaint. So it has a huge impact on our society and not just on women's lives, but on our own kind of public health. There's lost productivity um, and increased medical costs due to this um, substantially interfering um, and recurrent uh, condition. So now what have been, what's been shown to be the link between menstrual pain specifically and psychiatric symptoms? Well, there's been a lot of correlational studies and generally I'm just citing a few here. We see a relationship between depression and increased menstrual symptoms across pubertal development, including pain. And so that's in adolescence, we see that link. Um, in adults, there's a link between menstrual pain and increased aggression as well as insomnia and significantly reduced quality of life. So definitely a link there. Um, and what is interesting in endometriosis is that we see higher rates of psychiatric disorders as well as depressive symptoms in women with in endometriosis. But this relationship is primarily accounted for by the experience of pain. So women who have endometriosis and pain um, have those higher rates of psychiatric disorders and depression. Whereas women with endometriosis and no pain have significantly lower rates um, of psychiatric disorders and depression. So pain seems to be a particularly important variable here in its relationship to um, depression or other psychiatric um, issues. But is menstrual pain actually a risk factor? Um, as I've mentioned, we've seen a lot of correlations, um, but we don't really know for sure. There hasn't been any longitudinal work looking at menstrual pain and the later development of some of these um, psychiatric conditions. And part of what my research is on is looking at menstrual pain from a longitudinal perspective and how it relates to things that develop later on. Is menstrual pain a risk factor for chronic pain? I mean, we know chronic pain is associated, associated with a lot of psychiatric comorbidity. So this would be important to know if it was gonna put uh, women at risk. And a recent very large meta-analysis looked at this uh, dysmenorrhea as a potential risk factor and found that menstrual pain was associated with 2.5 times the odds of having chronic pain and it didn't ma matter whether it was chronic pelvic pain or not pelvic pain, whether it was a community sample or a clinical sample or in different geographical regions. So it does seem to be a risk factor pretty universally. The problem that we've experienced um, up until this point is that we don't know how, we don't know the mechanisms by which this happens. And that is one of the things that I'm most interested in is trying to identify some of these phenotypes and mechanisms by which this recurrent pain develops into chronic pain. One of the ways that we um, are able to test some of these potential mechanisms is by uh, exposing different populations to various types of pain stimuli um, in the laboratory. Here we're able to control the type of uh, stimulus that um, inflicts some level of pain and determine what their responses are. These data um, are from a, a review paper that I did several years ago, looking at what has been published in terms of comparing women with menstrual pain to women without and their responsiveness to laboratory stimuli. And generally, I would say across the different menstrual cycle phases and across the different stimuli used, women with menstrual pain are at least as or more sensitive to pain than women without menstrual pain, suggesting that there may be this overall pain sensitivity that could be a mechanism by which future chronic pain develops. In my own research, I explored this further in a slightly younger population 
So these were girls ages 16 to 25 um, who were exposed to a painful stimulus of a heat uh, thermode or probe being placed on their arm. And what's interesting is that the girls with menstrual pain were more sensitive um, to this painful stimulus across all phases of the menstrual cycle. So even when they weren't in pain during menstruation, they were still more sensitive to pain than the girls uh, without menstrual pain. And we're even exploring these kind of stable differences, um, looking at brain connectivity. These data are, are just pilot data from a very small study that I did in um, girls ages 14 to 15. And these data um, have not been published. But what you can see when you look at the, the differences in brains between the healthy controls and those with menstrual pain is that there's a lot more yellow circles um, in the brains of the girls uh, with menstrual pain. And those yellow circles represent kind of different regions of the brain that are more connected functionally. Um, and these are specifically in the sensory motor network. Now the girls were doing a resting state um, MRI during, uh, during this study. And so we're seeing these, these stable differences um, just while at rest. So this could be potentially another um, group difference that is putting them at risk for future pain conditions. And last, uh, just speaking to this overall um, hypersensitivity to pain that may be the risk factor, I wanted to present these data that were just released on PubMed on Monday from some colleagues of mine um, in Chicago. And they looked at adult women with menstrual pain and uh, subjected them to a number of different tasks. One was a bladder filling task they were looking at how much pain each participant experienced after their bladders became very full from drinking water. And then they also subjected them to an uncomfortable visual stimulus. This was um, blue and yellow squares um, arranged in a way that just is visually um, uncomfortable. And they looked at different levels of brightness. So the brighter the picture, the more excitation of the visual cortex. And what they found was that um, the excitation of the visual cortex and how unpleasant that was for each participant was moderated by bladder pain. So women with dysmenorrhea who had high bladder pain were more likely to rate the um, brighter picture as unpleasant. And basically what this speaks to is that some women with menstrual pain have this multi-sensory hypersensitivity. And perhaps it is that um, phenotype or subgroup of women that is at risk for developing additional pain um, problems. So given all of these data, we know how much menstrual pain impacts women's lives. Uh, we know that it's associated with psychiatric issues, potentially chronic pain in the future. Why don't we talk more about menstrual pain? And I think one of the first and, and probably obvious uh, answers is that um, there may be stigma around menstruation. And in fact, we know that there, have, there has been centuries of stigma around menstruation across the globe and across different cultures where it's really not appropriate to talk about it and where some women are even isolated during the period of menstruation. So the nature of the stigma is dependent on the culture. But in addition to multiculturalism, in our own country, we are still dealing with stigma as well. Um, we don't have a national curriculum for talking about reproductive health. And a lot of girls and women don't know how their reproductive anatomy functions or how to take care of themselves during menstruation. So this is a major problem really limiting women's and girls' abilities to um, take care of their own health, their own menstrual health in this way. But maybe this is changing a little bit. I did a little Google search a few days ago about uh, new menstrual health products. I 
like to think that I'm kind of aware of what's going on, but I came up with some things that I had no idea about, which is pretty, which are pretty innovative. Um, so one is period underwear. And so these are underwear for girls or women who um, would prefer not to use either a pad or a tampon or a menstrual cup. And so you can use the underwear and bleed freely and then just wash the underwear um, as with your you know, other clothes. And so this, uh, this provides an alternative for some girls and women who prefer not to use some of the other products. The kind of a clear cup shaped thing you see there is what's known as a menstrual cup. And this is a device uh, that's typically made of like silicone um, or some similar material. And it is inserted into the vagina and it kind of rests around the cervix and it collects the menstrual blood um, in a cup as opposed to in a tampon where it's absorbed. Um, this particular one is a new one and it's called a smart menstrual cup. So it actually links to an app on your phone and it can tell you when your uh, menstrual cup is full and uh, I guess alert you through the app, um, which I had no idea about. There's another piece, um, another item there. It looks kind of like a piece of jewelry and you actually can wear it as jewelry um, or you can clip it to your clothes and it monitors a lot of your kind of body's physiological processes and will help you keep track of your menstrual cycle and the app on your phone will then suggest that it's time to meditate or stretch or you know, alert you when you're about to get uh, your period. So that is also highly innovative. And then the last um, I also came up with, which I could only find in LA and um, I'm not totally surprised I'm from there, but you can actually hire uh, a period coach not entirely sure what this coach would do, but it sounds like they would kind of help you cope with different symptoms and maybe teach you different exercises um, to help you cope with your period. So there's uh, the menstrual health product market is huge. And I think it is probably doing quite a bit to reduce some of the stigma and provide options for girls and women um, to manage their own menstrual health. And so certainly a very positive direction there. But perhaps another reason that we don't talk about menstrual pain is that it hasn't been a priority in psychiatric care or research or maybe even health care. And now I have my second polling question and I want you to be honest about this. Um, if we could bring up the polling question. Do you include a measure or interview about the menstrual cycle or menstrual pain as part of your standard research or clinical assessment battery? I'll just give a few moments here. Sorry to let my cat out of the room. Okay. Um, okay, so it looks like the majority of people, 84% do not. And that is not surprising um, at all. Let's uh, stop sharing here. Um, I wanna show you some data from a large review study that was conducted in um, 2011, and it looked at the distribution of animal studies. So this was just animal studies by sex and field um, up until 2009. And here we see that there's been significant disparities in research um, regarding uh, inclusion of female, in this case, it was animals, um, but aspects of female participants. And it was only until a few years ago that NIH required sex as a biological variable. And we see in a number of these different fields here, um, immunology, neuroscience, um, physiology, pharmacology, that it was primarily studied with male animals or it was unspecified. And so this really limits our ability to understand pain specifically in women and specifically menstrual pain. 
And isn't it amazing that um, menstrual pain and menstruation affects half the population, but the other half of the population men, don't know what it's like. Um, now, of course, we know that this goes both ways and that women and girls also don't know what men and boys uh, experience as well. Um, and we can't totally appreciate their experiences. So it's, it's not one-sided. But since we are discussing menstrual pain, um, just on a lighter note, I'd like to show this video, which, which is actually an ad. It's not um, a, an experiment, a real experiment of any kind but that demonstrates what it might be like for men to experience menstrual pain. And this is done by attaching electrodes to the man's abdomen and back um, and stimulating muscle contractions that would be kind of similar to uh, menstrual pain. I work hard for that. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> They started on love. Oh my god! Oh my god, stop! Oh Jesus Christ! Oh! Ah! Oh, stop! What, that was 10%? Yeah. Is this what cramps are like? Is it 10%? 10 per, 10 How many times do you get that? Every month. Do you know it's coming? Um, no, not really. No, I feel vulnerable now. I want to hold my body. Oh. Yeah? Okay. Start. Is it going right now? Yeah. And you're talking to me? Yeah. That's what I was doing? Yeah. That's what I was doing. Okay. It's still going? It's been this going this whole like, time? This is probably like a minor period. You can just walk around and just pretend like nothing is happening? I have to do that. <laughs> so um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. It was just a, a, a funny <laughs> little video that I found. Um, anyway, getting back to why we don't typically talk about menstrual pain, I think there's also um, an assumption that we can just take a medication, um, specifically a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, which does work for a lot of women and girls. Um, and, but the assumption is that it works for everybody and that's, that's what we should just take, that there are treatment options available. Um, so it's really not much of a problem for many women. But in fact, there, there are pretty limited treatment options. So NSAIDs like ibuprofen, acetaminophen um, do work for some girls and women, but up to 18% of women report experiencing little or no benefit or relief um, from NSAIDs um, with regard to their menstrual pain. So this is a pretty big uh, portion of the population that is still suffering and can't find relief um, from these medications. Another uh, common suggestion is hormone treatments like birth control, um, the oral contraceptive pill. And um, these work by regulating the menstrual cycle, but uh, a review a few years ago actually looked at the impact of oral, the oral contraceptive pill on menstrual pain and found no substantial evidence for its efficacy um, in reducing menstrual pain. There are also complementary and alternative medicine approaches like acupuncture or massage or yoga. And some of the problems with these studies is that they've either had small sample sizes they haven't been well controlled, um, or it's difficult to uh, standardize a protocol um, that can be used across all participants. And so um, some evidence does support these uh, alternative medicine approaches, but again, they're not accessible for everybody um, and they can be quite costly. So um, that's not really a great option for most of the population. And that led me to think, you know, what, what other options could we create for uh, girls and women who struggle with menstrual pain? And one of the gold standard approaches for chronic pain is cognitive behavioral therapy. And I thought, well, why not apply this uh, to menstrual pain? So this is a study that I did that was published um, this year. Um, where I've developed a five session, 90 minute group 
for young women with moderate to severe primary dysmenorrhea. So this was uh, women with menstrual pain without a clear identified pathology, although I anticipate that these skills would, would work um, for secondary dysmenorrhea as well. And the group consisted of kind of four basic CBT components. There was psychoeducation about pain um, and about the menstrual cycle and menstrual pain. Um, there was a mindfulness component, so learning mindfulness, relaxation, learning decatastrophizing, which is basically cognitive uh, restructuring, cognitive challenging, and then developing and utilizing coping skills. In terms of the feasibility and acceptability, um, in this pilot study, we enrolled four cohorts and 20 out of the 24 enrolled completed it but all the dropouts were due to scheduling difficulties. So all 20 other uh, participants completed uh, the study by attending at least three out of five classes. They also rated the intervention very highly on the credibility factor of a specific questionnaire, suggesting that, that this type of group um, would be feasible and acceptable for this population. And in terms of the results, um, these are the results from a mixed model analysis looking um, at their average menstrual pain rating, beginning at pretreatment, at three month follow up, and then at 12 month follow up. And we did see a significant decrease um, in average menstrual pain rating over that year. Um, and it wasn't a huge decrease, but going from about an eight to maybe about a five or six. Is, is, can be quite notable. Two points is pretty significant um, and it could have an impact um, on enhancing quality of life. And in terms of the psychological measures, what was interesting is that we didn't see um, any significant changes in somatization or depression or anxiety. Um, again, this wasn't a clinical sample. This were, these were primarily college students um, without any psychiatric issues, but we did see a significant reduction in what's called pain catastrophizing um, over the course of that year, suggesting that they were um, better able to um, not catastrophize their thoughts about menstrual pain, uh, meaning that they um, didn't overestimate how bad it was going to be or um, underestimate how they could cope with it. And then even in the people that didn't experience improvement in pain during their qualitative um, interviews, we saw improvement in coping. So one quote was my menstrual pain didn't improve so much but my ability to mentally deal with it improved uh, or there was no improvement in the pain only in how to deal with it when it gets very bad. So suggesting that the group did offer something even if pain didn't change. So, now that we know all about the impact of the menstrual cycle, but particularly menstrual pain um, on girls and women um, and their uh, psychological and emotional experiences, what are we gonna do about it? I have a couple of thoughts. In terms of research, I think we must acknowledge that the menstrual cycle and menstrual pain are potentially critical biomarkers for female participants. And by not including these measures, we're really missing a, an incredibly important element of female participants' experience. So my first suggestion is try to measure the menstrual cycle in your studies. And you can do this in a very um, minimal, kind of low effort way to a very detailed way. You can start by just estimating the cycle phase based on the last menstrual period. It's not perfect. You won't know it exactly, but if their last menstrual period was five days ago, you're gonna know that they're probably uh, at the end of menstruation, they're in the uh, follicular phase, versus if it was 25 days ago, then they're probably in the luteal phase. Um, it'll be a little tougher if they're you know, about 14 or 15 days from their last menstrual period because you're not entirely sure if they've ovulated at that point, but at least you'll get a better sense of kind of where things are at. 
You could also have participants prospectively track their menstrual cycle using one of many, many free apps available, um, maybe prior to coming in for the research study. And this would give you an even clearer sense, not relying on their memory of their last menstrual period, but when it actually happened. Um, and it might be able to provide even more detailed information. Another possibility is if, if you're already collecting saliva or blood samples, um, you could analyze those for estradiol and progesterone and at least get an estimate of the um, hormonal influences that may be um, that they may be experiencing, um, as well as potentially where they were in the menstrual cycle. And additionally, you can include a measure of menstrual pain. Um, this can be a simple question, like on average, how much pain do you have during your period on a scale from zero to 10? Zero being no pain, 10 being the worst pain possible. Um, that is a pretty standard measure and it's one question and it may be something that um, could provide some additional insight into what your participants are experiencing on the day of the research session. You could also go very detailed and get a, a very detailed menstrual pain history, such as when menstruation started, when pain started, um, has it changed over the course since the pain started, has gotten worse, gotten better. Um, and this could provide a lot of detailed information as well. In terms of clinical perspectives, we know that menstrual pain and changes in the menstrual cycle are affecting your patients. Um, it's just the case that they are likely experiencing um, fluctuations in all sorts of different symptoms over the menstrual cycle. And so talking about it is part of their mental health care. You can start talking about it by just asking if menstrual pain is a problem asking if they notice that their symptoms change around menstruation or maybe at some other point in the cycle and how this is affecting them uh, because this will allow you to work with them in the future to potentially problem solve some of these uh, challenges that they experience on a regular basis. So then what do you do with all of this information? I think if, if menstrual pain or menstrual symptoms um, are a significant problem, really encourage your patients to see a doctor. And if the doctor doesn't provide sufficient care or um, attention to this, then they may need to see a different doctor or even a specialist, but they should be able to have um, a physician that is attentive and um, working with them to help with any symptoms or problems that they're experiencing. You can help your patients track their menstrual cycle and their emotional symptoms to really look for patterns. This is what I mentioned a little bit earlier, that by, by being able to predict when symptoms are going to occur, it'll give them a sense of um, control and allow you both to work together to plan ahead for these times that are gonna be more challenging. You can help them identify stressors and problem solve ways to reduce stress. Um, and that may have an impact um, on their ability to function with symptom changes in, in the cycle, teaching relaxation strategies, developing new appraisals for what the pain means. Maybe it doesn't mean that it's going to be, you know, several days of just being isolated and in bed. Maybe it could mean that it's uncomfortable and things have to be done differently, but there are other activities to do to still um, foster a sense of wellness and health. And you can help your patients develop a sense of mastery over the pain by learning these new ways of coping and learning all sorts of different ways of coping. It can be um, an interesting experiment to try out all sorts of different things and see um, what might be helpful tools in specific situations. So in conclusion, <laughs> um, menstrual pain is a very real and serious problem for a huge portion of our population. And if you haven't experienced it, it's very likely that a friend or family member of yours has so I encourage you to get comfortable with the topic and consider that the menstrual cycle and menstrual pain 
um, are important things in both research and clinical work so that we can continue to address the stigma of menstruation, reduce health disparities for women, particularly around menstruation, and better serve uh, women's physical and mental health needs. And with that, um, I would just like to acknowledge my research team and collaborators, in particular, Laura Seidman, who is my lab and project manager and has been a part of this research from the beginning, as well as Dr. Greenfield, Dr. Lucas, Dr. Nickerson, Dr. Kumar, and Dr. Pizzagalli, and my collaborators from outside of the McLean um, hospital system. The lab website is at the bottom. If you're interested in learning more, feel free to go there and explore a little bit about uh, the studies that are happening now. Um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Payne. That was a, um, that was a great presentation. And uh, it, it raises a lot of issues and a lot of questions, at least in my mind, um, I wanna remind people, if you do have questions, please type them into the question and answer box. We'll get through as many of them as we can. But, um, you know, I, I have um, one or two questions, thoughts, challenges, just off the top of my head. And, you know, so one, you know, one issue is that, as you mentioned, um, menstruation itself, just the pure act of menstruation has been stigmatized and shamed and for, for millennia. Um, we're not supposed to talk about it. It's embarrassing. It's, it's somehow dirty. It's somehow, you know, tainted. Like that's not something that people in good company are supposed to discuss. Right. Um, you add to that the lack of clinical efficacy of actually doing anything about the menstrual pain. Um, so even the, you know, you mentioned that hormones are very commonly used, but unfortunately there's not good evidence that they actually do anything for the pain. And then on top of that, you know, I'm aware of a whole body of literature that shows women who take oral contraceptive pills are more likely to have clinical depression. So we might actually be adding insult to injury. Not only are we not helping their menstrual pain or cramps, but we might actually be contributing to the psychiatric comorbidities that are commonly found. And we have pretty good robust data that women on, you know, contraception are, you know, more likely to have all sorts of psychiatric disorders, suicidality, depression, all sorts of other things. Um, and then on top of that, you, you made a very compelling, obvious case for the comorbidity between menstrual pain and psychiatric you know, uh, challenges. And we know psychiatric illnesses are highly stigmatized. And, um, you know, people, if they are depressed, they're just supposed to stop complaining. They're supposed to suck it up. Just, you know, you have to complain all the time. Um, and, and so when you combine those, when you combine those, like somebody who is chronically depressed and now is having increased pain every month and people are kind of just getting tired of, the person complaining, tired of nothing helping. You've tried five different pills and none of them are working. You've been to three different doctors who all kind of write you off and say, well, just tough it up. You know, that woman in the commercial could take it. Why can't you? Um, and I've, you know, honestly, I've heard women say that about other women. Like, you know, she's just looking for attention. She's just, you know, I, I have cramps too, but I just, I just manage them. And like, why can't she just manage them? Obviously as a psychiatrist, I fully understand that people have different experiences. And, and just because, you know, you've had slight depression doesn't mean it's the same thing as crippling depression in another person, but there's just so much shame and stigma and how do we, how do we really start to address the, I mean, those are just in my mind, monumental 
obstacles and challenges to actually overcome? I, I agree. I, I think that it's so pervasive and so much a part of our culture that it is very challenging to overcome. Um, but I think there are beginning to be opportunities for doing that. I do think for someone, for a woman who is experiencing disabling pain every month or maybe even more frequently than every month, finding a physician that really understands that, whether it's, um, it, it may be a gynecologist, it may be an anesthesiologist specializing in pelvic pain, that is critical. Um, and not so much because I think they'll have a new pill or, or a new intervention, but having a team that really understands the nature of pain is, is essential for recovery. So, um, and it may take time to do that. And I understand that it's probably an incredibly frustrating process of going to various doctors, but ideally looking for somebody who's a pain specialist. Um, and I think that having that person as part of their team will at least provide some comfort that there is someone who understands really what that's about. Additionally, I think there are opportunities um, in terms of online connections and support groups that, you know, I don't know if they're going to necessarily reduce pain or reduce menstrual symptoms or psychiatric symptoms, but where there are communities that women can at least share information um, or connect with other women who um, struggle with the same things. I know there's, there are a ton of menstrual tracking apps out there and many of them do have online supports and, and, and information. Um, so I think having those connections will be part of reducing the stigma as well. Um, I do think the menstrual health product industry is going is probably going to do the most. You know, there's this is a a huge, huge industry that is developing, including apps, um, and that it is becoming very commonplace now to see these ads for different menstrual products. And the more we get used to it, I think the more we can start to um, appreciate that this is so important. Um, for all women and girls, but, um, and so disabling for many. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the, on the, um, on the topic of finding a compassionate and hopefully effective physician, mm -hmm. um, do, do you have any kind of list of resources? Because it's, it's kind of like finding a mental health professional in a way mm -hmm. like these days that, that, that can be challenging as well. And so I imagine finding, you know, either a primary care doctor or, as you mentioned, a pain specialist or yeah. um, OBGYN who specializes in this and takes it very seriously and is really going to work with the patient over time yeah. to do to do the best possible treatment and not mm -hmm. minimize it, but maybe let the patient know that this is going to be a long haul problem and maybe the first thing we try isn't going to work and yeah. keep coming back. I exactly. want to hear about. I want to hear whether this is effective or not. I'm, we're in this together, and we're gonna we're gonna try to, you know, minimize your discomfort. It can be really hard to find a doctor like that. So do yes. you have, do you have a list or recommendations, or could we put something like that on brainwaves, where just like you're looking for a doctor who is really good at this, maybe consider these five doc local docs or something. Yes, um, I would say that there, there's a professional group that I'm very much involved with called the International Pelvic Pain Society. And they do have a provider referral list um, on the website. Now it's not extensive. Um, there, I'm sure there are people in the Boston area, but sometimes even contacting somebody who is um, not maybe right in the area you're looking for, but a couple hours away, they're usually kind of familiar with who is in the area and may be able to recommend somebody. So looking on a provider list, and even if it's not uh, feasible for you to go to a person, contacting them to see if they know of anyone in your area. Um, 
Uh, myself and some other colleagues at Newton Wellesley Hospital have also um, founded the, the Boston area Women's Pain Collaborative. And so this group um, we just met last night actually consists of psychologists, um, gynecologist, physical therapist, um, anesthesiologist, and we don't have any formal referral list, but if, um, if somebody specifically wanted to contact me, I could reach out and look for who has availability for, for, for people who at least are attending, you know, this, um, this Grand Rounds, and I'd be happy to do that. That's great. Um, somebody typed into the comments that our women's health nurse practitioner colleagues might also be able to help manage um, some of these patients. Yes, um, yes. And I will go to our at least next question, which is any, you know, CBD, cannabidiol is like the cure-all right now for pretty much everything on the planet. And so what about, what about CBD for menstrual pain? You know, somebody's thought of that, um, but you'd have to ask uh, Dr. Stacy Gruber about that. So she's actually um, doing a trial right now for, um, I don't know the name of the product. Um, it was referred to as like the, the weed suppository. <laughs> so it's a suppository um, with CBD um, for menstrual pain. And so I don't know, uh, I don't think they're done with this study yet, but somebody has thought of that. Um, and, and who knows, that could be another great option um, if it shows to, to uh, result in improvement in pain. Great. Um, I am not seeing additional questions. And so I think with that, we'll go ahead and conclude. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Payne, for a wonderful presentation on such an important topic that thank people you. aren't really talking about. So this is, I think this is really helpful. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone. Thanks all.